Our guest speaker tonight has engaged in three of the least noble professions on record. <laughs> Law, politics, and the selling of used cars. <laughs> Rank those any way you want. <laughs> He's currently running for mayor of Phoenix, Arizona. And he has three children and a fourth on the way. And I've got four bags of newspaper I'm too lazy to take to the recycling bin. <laughs> he is adept at making soul, I'm sorry, sourdough bread. And he's seeking his third term as the head of the LNC. And we are all very appreciative that he's taken time out of his busy schedule to address us tonight. So without any further ado, please welcome Nick Salwark. quality used cars. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you so much for inviting me back to Illinois. This has always been one of the strongest state parties in the country, and it's incredibly stronger than it was the last time I was here. The, the growth that I've seen in your candidate recruitment, the quality of the candidates that are seeking your nominations, the growth in chapters, the growth in precinct committeemen, the stepping up to the challenges of becoming uh, a different kind of political party in the state, jumping through the hoops that the state puts in front of you. I've been talking to people since I got here and a lot of people have different views of who should be the nominees. Congratulations to Mr. Jackson, a hard-fought victory. A lot of people have different views about what the Libertarian Party should be, what we should focus on. But in talking to everybody over the weekend, you all have been so kind to each other in how you're conducting yourselves in remembering that the enemy of freedom is not inside this room, it's out there that we focus on not what divides us but what brings us together, that we look out for each other and we don't engage in pointless sniping inside the party. You guys are doing that and so now I don't have anything to talk to you about <laughs> because I would give you a lecture about that and now I'm not able to, so I had to write something else. How many people have heard the lobster story? Only one. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Libertarians are lobsters. So a lobster, uh, there's a really good video you can find online by Rabbi Tversky, talks about lobsters. Lobsters are crustaceans, right? So lobsters have a hard shell around them. Um, and then they, when they grow, the shell starts to hurt because they're getting bigger, they're growing, but the shell's hard, it doesn't flex. And so at a certain point, they're in enough pain and discomfort that they have to go crawl under a rock in the ocean, cast off their old shell and grow a new one. They have to go to a safe place and come out bigger and stronger. And they do this year over year. Every time they get to the, the limits of their old shell, they change. There's some things we can learn from lobsters. Growth hurts. Growth is painful. As our party grows, there's pain. New people come in, some people leave, people fight. But without that pain, there is no change. If a lobster never grew, he'd use the same shell for all of his life 
And we'd all eat tiny little lobsters at dinner. But they do grow. Yeah, crawfish. Totally different thing. No similarities. <laughs> Where we are as a political party is we are at a growth point. The, the, the results of the 2016 presidential election were incredible. They were far and away beyond anything we'd ever done. There's easily twice as many people in the room as there were two years ago here in Illinois. We're seeing that all around the country. There are pockets where we slide back a little bit, but overall, everything is positive. Part of keeping that positive is realizing that this growth is going to be painful, that there are people who have been part of this party for a very long time who care very deeply about this party and what it means to them. And they see the new faces and they're excited to see new people. But they're also scared. There's fear. And the fear is that these new people, they seem nice, but they don't know what I know about what this party means. They don't know what we went through to get to this place. They take for granted some of the things that we have. And maybe they don't understand, and maybe they're going to turn this party into something different from what I was building, from what I was defending. I have good news for you. That may happen. The Libertarian Party of next year or next decade will be different from the Libertarian Party of last year or last decade. That's the best news I can give you. We're not the same as we always have been. We're the only political party in this country growing at all. That's incredible. We need to seize that growth and take advantage of it and not be too afraid. Part of that is welcoming new people. It's very easy to welcome people who are like you. It's very hard to welcome people who are not like you. We need to be better at welcoming people who are not like us. When new people come to your chapter meetings, when they seek to run for office, they seek to volunteer, they're not going to be perfect libertarians. They're not going to be hundred hundreds on the Nolan chart, you know, running around screaming taxation is theft. I mean, they might be, but it's rare. Every one of us has gone on a path to get to where we are tonight. And the only thing that can stop people from getting along that path to where they're trying to get is you. The people who come to a new meeting and they're not treated with kindness and treated with respect, they won't keep going down the path. They'll get as far as they got before they got kicked out and then they'll leave and they'll go do something else. Don't let that happen. Be nice to people. You guys are already doing it. See, this is like a lecture you don't need. <laughs> but maybe, maybe, every so often you forget something. We need to reach out actively to people who are not like us, who don't have the same values that we have, who don't have the same hot-button issues that we have. You know, if you're a gun guy, go reach out to people who are not gun guys. Reach out to people who are in favor of gun control. Go talk to people who are interested in taxation. Go talk to people who are interested in civil rights. Listen to what is important to them because that's going to make you a better advocate for the things you care about. And it's going to show them the respect that will make them want to hear what you care about. We need to have an outward focus. Getting to this point was hard. Political parties in this country die all the time. We're not dead, so that's good. <laughs> but what got us to here is not what will get us to the next level. There is a building of a party when you're very small and you're a guerrilla band that's different from when you grow up, when you have organization in all 50 states, when you're starting to fill rooms like this and even bigger, when you're packing conventions nationally. There's another level we have to take it to. And the first step in that is to listen to what other people care about. Ask your neighbors what is important to them. What are their concerns? What do they want for their children? Listen. And if you don't have an answer for their problem, that's okay. They're going to be happy that you actually listen to their problem. And maybe you won't have the answer, but maybe that'll spur you to think of one. And come back and say, you know what, I listened to you, Eric, and you told me what your problem was. 
and I think this might be a better way we can approach it. Well, how does that sound to you? That's not a conversation about what you want to talk about. It's what they want to talk about. And that's the first step in getting to that next level of getting more people to join our party. The other thing to remember is every single one of you in this room is valuable. And I know that you all don't all do libertarianism in the same way. Some people are candidates for office. They put on suits. They look nice on TV. They're able to put things into sound bites. Other people are rabble rousers. They go and they have protests and signs and they do direct action and they say mean things and sometimes they use foul language. Maybe they're not the sort of people you'd invite to a party. But they're part of our party, so there we are. They're all valuable. If you watch a crime show, there's this concept of good cop, bad cop. Does everybody know about good cop, bad cop? There's a mean cop. And there's the nice cop. And the nice cop gets the suspect to talk to him because the mean cop is so mean. They don't have TV shows with good cop, good cop. Because that's just boring. <laughs> and they don't have TV shows with bad cop, bad cop. Because then it's just a dead suspect. And then you have a whole bunch of airtime. What are you going to fill it with? <laughs> the contrast is what makes it work. So maybe you're the guy who wants to be straight-laced and, you know, not scare the normals. That's great. But you need to realize that you need the guy who does scare the normals because that's that push that makes people more interested in listening to you. And you may be the person who wants to go march in the streets, but you need to realize if you, if you actually shake people loose of their ideas – you need some guy in a suit to come up afterwards and say, hey, you know that crazy person, those ideas that you're now woken to? I'm a candidate that supports those. And look, I wear a suit. I look nice. <laughs> we need each other. This is not a big enough party that we can be kicking people out. It doesn't work. So be nice to each other. Politics in this country is a contest for control. It's control over other people. It's government control over lives. And there's an argument between the Republicans and the Democrats over which one of them get to control your life and what part of your life they get to tell you you have to do something with. Libertarian politics is fundamentally different from Republican and Democratic politics. We are, like 7-Up is the uncola. we are the anti-politics. We are about positions, not personalities. We're about people, not politics. What is the opposite of individual freedom? Anyone? Government control. Every time you increase individual freedom, you reduce government control. Every time you pass a law and you add government control, you reduce individual freedom. There is no other political party in this country that just denies the entire left-right political spectrum. It's not about which part of the life of yours that I want to control. It's not moving this way or this way. It's going up. More individual freedom, less government control. Every issue, every time. And it opens up the ability to connect with people on a level that old party politicians can't connect with them on because they're constantly thinking, how will you help me get a job where I get to tell you how to live your life? That creates for some weird relationships. We're looking at people and saying, how can I help you have more control over your life so you can find your own happiness? That's a powerful message. And no, it's not going to get you big lobbyist money. But your neighbors care about that. And they care about you going out there and standing for them. And it makes it so that we're essentially unstoppable. Once people understand what we're trying to do, really get it. You talk to them in language they understand. They don't go back. Libertarianism is like the Hotel California. <laughs> or a Roach Motel. I'm still working on the analogy. I'm trying to come up with something positive, optimistic. You know, nobody ever gets to leave. One of us, one of us. I, it's, it's almost there. I'm very close. <laughs> but it's true. 
It's a sticky idea. Once you start thinking about human freedom in that way, that anything that's peaceful is okay. If you're not hurting other people, it's okay to live your life as crazy as you want to be. You can't unlearn that idea. You can't go back. So you're all stuck with me, or I'm stuck with you, or something. But when it comes to political spectra, we spend too much time in our party arguing over which side of the spectrum are you on. You know, are you an anarchist who believes that we should have no government at all? Or are you a minarchist that believes we should have a small government, but a little one? Petite. Are you a radical that wants to abolish the state tomorrow and doesn't want to hear anything about compromise? Or are you a pragmatist where you want to just, you know, if we can get cold beer on Sundays in Indiana, there's going to be something else past that, and we'll just take baby steps, baby steps, just keep swimming. None of these spectra, then there's the other one, are you on the left or are you on the right, which is just a silly question at all. We're up. All these spectra are not important. Nobody cares. You shouldn't care. There's only one spectrum that's important within the Libertarian Party. And I'm in charge, so I get to tell you this. <laughs> and that's the spectrum between being a nice person and being a jerk. I don't care where you are left and right. I don't care where you are radical or pragmatist or minarchist or anarchist. I care whether or not you're nice whether or not you're kind, whether or not you treat other people with respect and dignity that we all deserve. Because I can teach a nice person how to be a libertarian. It's really hard to teach a jerk to stop being a jerk. Woo! When it comes to that, who is the most important libertarian in this room? <laughs> Definitely partial credit. <laughs> the most important libertarian in this room is you. It's not me. It's you. Because for a lot of you, you're the only libertarian your friends know. You're the only libertarian your family knows. You're the only libertarian your coworkers know. And you have more power over the success of the Libertarian Party than I do. Because if you go out and set a good example for your coworkers, or you go out and set a good example for your neighbors, or you go to a community meeting and say, you know what, somebody should do something about the taxes in this community, and no one else is, so I'm going to take some time away from my life to run for office to try and protect all of you. If you go do that, you move the party so much farther down the field than any national political interview can ever do, than any LNC meeting can ever do. Because you change somebody's mind about what they think of a libertarian. If they think of a libertarian as being a nice, kind, respectful, honest human being, everything else is easy. So no pressure, <laughs> but go be that libertarian. Build up our new leaders. Um, one of the things that's so impressive to me in coming to this convention is the amount of cooperation and working together that Lex and Bennett obviously have. That Lex has done the thing that everybody wants to do, which is find somebody who's good enough and hopefully better at the job than you are and not doing it anymore, which <laughs> I didn't say you were allowed to quit, but <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Um, there's a saying that good leaders create followers, but great leaders create other leaders. That's how we multiply 
is if you bring along other people and you show them how to do the things that you do and you let them surpass you, it'll be better for everybody. This is going to loop back a little bit. Do you guys know about the resistance? So after Trump was elected, um, there's a resistance where we resist the president. It's interesting because it did galvanize a lot of people. But what it is is mostly whatever the president does, we don't like. So if he says the sky is blue, no, it's not. If he says up is up, no, it's down. And it makes for a very predictable politics that's reactionary. I mean, it's the definition of being reactionary. He says something, we say no. It's not inspirational. And too many of us sometimes go out and tell people everything it is that we're against, everything that we hate. We hate taxes. We hate gun control. We hate the war on drugs. We hate this. We hate that. Hate is a strong emotion. And I don't love any of those things. But hate isn't sticky. When you rile people up against something, it's not a sustainable emotion. And eventually, the person that you attract with hate is going to find something they hate more. And they're going to go on to that thing. Or they're going to find the thing that they hate about you which they just hadn't gotten around to yet, and then they're going to leave, take their ball and go home. A lot of what we see in advertising and political strategy and on social media is trying to motivate people with hate. It's triggering their buttons, it's setting them off, it's making them shake their fist at their computer or the television and say, ah, Springfield! That's not enough to get you through a 1,000, 5,000, 25,000 signature petition drive. You can't do that on hate. It's not enough to win public office. It's not enough to go and run for public office and then run again and run again. You know, um, I'll tell you, Kara Schultz from Minnesota is our new candidate recruitment person at National. We have a person full-time. Her only job is to recruit libertarians to run for office. So pretty awesome job. One of the things that was important to me in hiring Kara, who, by the way, is already over 600 candidates towards a 2,000 candidate nationwide goal in 2018, just to brag on her a little bit, <laughs> one of the things that was important to me in hiring Kara for that job was that she was a loser. In 2014, Kara Schultz ran for city council in Burnsville, Minnesota, while struggling with cancer, burned through three pairs of shoes knocking on doors, and she lost. In 2016, she went back and she ran for the same city council seat, still struggling with cancer, and she won. That's the person you need to talk to somebody about running for office as a libertarian. Somebody who has tasted victory, but knows what defeat means, and knows that you don't quit, that you remain a happy warrior, that you get back up, you dust yourself off, and you run again, and you do it again and again and again and again and again until you win. That's what we do. That's what it means to be a libertarian. But to do that, it can't be because you hate the government. You have to love freedom. You have to love your neighbors. You have to love your friends enough to want them to have a better life. You have to love your community. You have to love your children enough to spend time away from them. But that love will keep you going in a way that hate never will. That'll keep you coming back. That'll let you get through it. So be honest, be kind, 
Focus on positions, not people. Criticize ideas, not people. Be happy warriors. We're not expected to win very much. I think we all know that. But we play all the games. Everyone. And we keep coming back. And we try harder. And we care more. And we keep doing better. So keep that in mind. Um, I want to talk about a couple of candidates that give it a good example of how far we've come. Uh, we had a candidate in Texas for statewide race for railroad commissioner named Mark Miller. He was endorsed by every newspaper in the state of Texas that does endorsements for a statewide race in a four-way race. Every single newspaper that does endorsements endorsed the Libertarian for that office. He got just over 5%. 5.03, I think. So is that good or is that bad? It's good. It's also bad. It's bad that you can have the endorsements of every paper in Texas and get 5%. That sucks. It's awesome that we have a candidate who is so strong and competent in his field seek out the Libertarian Party to run under our banner that the best candidate in the race is our guy. In the presidential race in 2016, you know, you have to do a lot of spin as a party chair. But I could confidently say, we have the candidate who is most qualified to be president. Like, you just look at resume, he's the guy. No offense to any previous libertarian candidates for president, but that's not always a true statement. So we're making progress. Um, I was reading a good book by Guy Kawasaki called uh, Reality Check. You should check it out. Guy Kawasaki has some really cool ideas. But one of his big things, he was an evangelist for Apple back when they made the Macintosh. He was responsible for getting people who were so passionate about their products that they would go and tell their friends and be you know, those annoying Apple people. That's what libertarians need to be, is evangelists for this. You need to be on fire for this. You can't be, you know, yeah, I'm a libertarian too. Eh, what was on TV last night? You have to believe. One of his lessons for evangelism, look for the agnostics, ignore the atheists. When you go out to talk to people about libertarian ideas, about these things, it's just like petitioning. The guy who wants to tell you all the reasons why libertarians shouldn't be on the ballot is probably a perfectly lovely human being who loves his children that you don't need to spend any more time talking to. <laughs> you can tell that guy to have a nice day. Go on with your bad self somewhere else. And you go talk to somebody who does want more choices. I don't think our growth is going to come from disgruntled Republicans and Democrats. We will get disgruntled Republicans and Democrats just by leaving the light on and being good people. But our growth is going to come from those people who haven't made up their mind. The people who aren't sure, not the people who are already dead set against us. And you'll get more progress by focusing on that. You know, uh, Nassim Taleb talks about, in one of his recent books, suckers win arguments. Or suckers try to win arguments. Non-suckers try to win. Don't go out there trying to be right. Let's go out there and do what you have to do to win. Go out there and show them who you are. Don't go out there trying to, to win an argument on the side of uh, a fair table. It's not worth it. There's no edge in it. Don't try and win the arguments inside the party. I mean, this is just advice. Arguing over who's king of the very small hill is time spent not building the hill. So go bring more people in. There are so many issues right now that we have available to us. Um, there are orphan issues. There is nobody supporting spending cuts in government right now. There is no one supporting open immigration right now. There's no one supporting ending the war on drugs right now. There's no one supporting free trade right now. We've been given a gift by the old parties where they're liars. 
And their dishonesty is their own problem, but it's our opportunity. I have so many people talk to me and say, I can't even believe that they stand for what they say they stand for anymore. The Democrats don't stand up for the little guy anymore. The Republicans don't care about free trade or the economy. They don't lower taxes. There's nothing left over there. Politics is one of these things where everything is true in an ironclad law until it's not. One day, the Berlin Wall is definitely a giant wall where you'll get shot if you try and cross it between East and West Germany. And the next day, it's down. One day. It takes one day. Everything's true until it's not. Our goal is to be ready for that opportunity to come, to be where the puck is going to be, not where the puck is, to build up the infrastructure, to get those 2,000 candidates running nationwide so they inspire the people in their communities to be the next people who come to the next convention. That's how you find people. That's how you bring them in. You give them something to do where they feel like they're going to make a change in their community. If you have a why, you can tolerate any how. If you find out what drives you, what makes you care about this stuff so much that you'll spend that time to do it, everything else is details. Yep, it's going to take a lot of money, so we start raising money. It's going to take a lot of petition signatures, so we start going to get those. But we're going to do what we have to do to have a world that's set free in our lifetime. I want to leave you with this. I, I don't like everybody in my family. <laughs> I don't. There are family members that I would probably not invite over for dinner. Um, there are family members that I don't let babysit my kids. You may all like everybody in your family. I'm not sure. I also don't like every libertarian believe it or not all of you guys of course but <laughs> but in my family when you get together for holidays when somebody's in trouble when there's a wedding or there's a funeral we come together because even though we may not like each other all the time we love each other. I said that we're not a political, political party. We're anti-politics. I think we're more of a family than a party. And while I may not like all of you, I love each and every one of you. Love each other work together, focus on the important stuff and help us grow, help us break out of our shell, bring new people in so that we can all have a world set free in our lifetime. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Do you know why? Because you asked me. That's a huge lesson for libertarians all around this country. Uh, I used to work for a sales manager that would say, you know, if you don't ask for the money, you're not going to get the money. He said, sometimes you're going to ask, you're not going to get. But you don't ask, you never get. So ask. Other questions? Sir? Sir? No. <laughs> but I appreciate that you asked. <laughs> and I encourage every Republican in your district to give you lots of money. <laughs> Sir. Would you mind sharing a little bit about your personal background and how you got to where you are today? Sure. Um, so I... I became a libertarian around 10, 11, 12 years old. My dad would take me to Maricopa County meetings in Phoenix, and I met people and read Berglund's Libertarianism in One Lesson. 
it's a good book. It's worth reading still. Um, everything made sense about it. You know, hey, it's not my business what other people do. Government's not their business either. So I've always been a libertarian. Um, I went to undergrad in just outside of D.C. for computer science. I did a long time consulting, uh, mostly for the federal government in IT. I uh, got inspired by a libertarian law firm called the Institute for Justice that stopped Donald Trump from taking a little old lady's house in Atlantic City to build limo parking. And I thought, you know, it sounds like going to law school, you could probably help people and you know fight back against the government. So I went to law school, actually ended up clerking for IJ during law school, and then uh, spent five years as a deputy public defender uh, just south of Colorado, or uh, south of Denver in Arapahoe County. Tried 36 trials to a jury. Um, nobody down for life, so yay me, I guess. <laughs> yay them, really. Um, and at the end of 2014, I ended up running for national chair uh, and got it. And my dad wanted to retire from the car business. So uh, our family moved down back to Phoenix, um, fall of 2014, been running a used car dealership ever since. That's that's pretty much it. Simple. <laughs> yes. What position? What what is your question about him? Um, I chaired the meeting in which there was a vote on whether or not to remove him from the board. Does that answer your question or not? <laughs> No, I was the chair. I don't vote except if there's ties, to break ties usually. Um, and part of the reason for that, there's a couple of reasons. One, the national committee is made up of 17 people currently. Uh, eight of them are regional representatives, five of them are at-large members, four of them are officers. No member of the committee has any authority over any other member of the committee. So there's no subordinate relationships on the board. The chair is not in charge of the vice chair or the secretary or the treasurer or any of the regional reps or any of the at-large reps. Only the convention delegates get to select who they put on the LNC. And that's by design. We have a board that's not designed to be effective. It's designed to allow all of the voices within the Libertarian Party to be represented. So that's how you end up with you know, a board where you have somebody who always wears a suit and you have Star Child from California. They represent different groups within our party and different ideas that people have about the best way to spread the message. I don't think that it's productive to spend time fighting to kick people out of the party because what you're left with is smaller and once you start going down that road, and I don't know if you paid attention to previous LNCs, when the LNC starts going down the road of trying to remove members, it seldom stops after the first one. They're like, um, it's a Lay's potato chips. You can't eat just one. Oh, it's Pringles. Yeah, so you, it ends up being us focusing on each other and not focusing outside. Um, I will tell you that I have never been asked by a reporter about any other member of the LNC. Or by a constituent about any member of the LNC. Or by anyone other than people inside the party who are agitating for change inside the party. So it's, it's very easy to think that the thing that's most concerning to you is the most important thing. That's not always the case. Did I answer your question? I just don't understand how somebody can express views like that and assume that they're representing you. It just, I just don't follow that. Well, they were selected by the delegates at convention in Orlando. Well, I don't think you said that then. May, no, I don't think so. But what, what would you do? Okay, and if it doesn't work, then what? 
Okay. Well, that's where we're at. There was an attempt to remove that came down many votes short. There was a censure motion that passed, and we're back to business as usual. You know, that's the other thing that Bastiat talked about, the scene and the unseen. The scene is, do you get to kick somebody off of a board? The unseen is, how do you work together after you don't kick them off of the board? Did that answer your question? Thank you. Other questions, sir? Uh, a couple months ago, uh, when I was involved in a conversation on Facebook, you mentioned the uh, health care plan, and I believe you mentioned Singapore. I looked up a little bit uh, on that. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, Singapore has one of the better health care systems in the world. And what they've done is they managed to balance having a social safety net. So there's a, basically a net that captures catastrophic or terminal or chronic illness where the government ends up kicking in. But everything is fee for service um, just between the consumer and their doctor up to an amount of money the government makes people put in a certain percentage of their money into a health savings account, and they have to buy their health care with money from that account before any of the safety net kicks in. And it builds up over time, so they build up more over the, the course of their life so that people still look for value. They try and find a doctor who is reasonably priced because it's their money until it's something ridiculous where it's in the hundreds of thousands. Um, that kind of system, if you really wanted to fix the healthcare system in this country, that's the sort of thing you do because you keep the incentives right. You know, the reason that healthcare costs are so out of control is it's, you know, you're, you give money to your employer who gives money to a health insurance company who gives money to a doctor, and there's no incentive for you to care what the doctor costs. You know, it's either covered by your insurance or it's not. You take incentives away and people do bad things. You put incentives back, stuff's pretty amazing. You know, if you look at um, laser eye surgery, that's l literal lasers being shot into your eyes. That has gone down in cost year over year and gotten better in quality. And the biggest difference is it's not covered by health insurance. It's an elective procedure, so there is competition in that market. Yes. Awesome. Very cool. <laughs> Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> we don't acknowledge the Johnny Depp film. <laughs> Finally, something that gets people to stand. Other questions? Yes. Black. But it's also good when it goes with gold or gray. Other questions? No other questions. Awesome. Oh, sir. Yeah, so we don't do well in all the elections. Um, one of the ones that, that most recently, shocking, isn't it? Um, it's like the Mark Miller thing. Uh, you know, Allison Foxall just ran for State House in Florida District 72, I think. Don't remember. But it's a special election. She raised more money than any libertarian candidates raised for a state house race in Florida ever. I mean, she was like thirty-five, forty thousand dollars, uh, which is huge for us. And she got three percent of the vote. Part of the issue with that is it was a special election, 
and the Republicans and Democrats combined put in $1.1 million into a state house race. That's a lot of money. That's good and it's bad, right? We didn't have breakout numbers, but we made them burn so much more money, so many more resources by showing up that we are able to provide, for my money, the Libertarian Party is still the highest return on investment that anyone can get in the entire liberty movement because our candidates get up on stage, they get to be in debates, they get to drive public policy forward, and even the threat of taking away votes from the old party candidates makes them change their positions. Obama and Clinton did not get to the front of the marriage equality parade because they necessarily had a change of conscience. They want to get elected, and they saw that that was where the voters went. That's where we need to take advantage of some of these issues where the old parties aren't touching them. If we get over to where the voters are, we can leave those old parties behind in an instant. It's like that domino tips, and then we're in a good place. So it's always going to be choppy around the country. Some states are doing better than others. You guys are doing awesome. Others are not doing as well. Ask me next year. It's going to be different states. But the overall trend lines are up, and all of the trends are moving in our direction. Young people are more libertarian than older people. Um, people are not joining the Republican and Democratic parties anymore at all. They are joining the Libertarian Party, and we're seeing amazing growth in campaigns and candidates and fundraising and members. Um, everything's pretty awesome. Yes, sir. I think we'll destroy one or both of the old parties. Yeah. And I'm convinced that, you know, the first libertarian president is running for office in 2018. Now, they're not running for president in 2018, but one of this army of over 2,000 candidates around the country is likely to be that one who is there where the puck ends up, who's ready to take advantage of that. That's what kind of keeps me going, is that we're moving in that direction. So I think there's some amazing stuff coming. Yes? What's your favorite part of being chair? My favorite part of being chair. Yeah, no, see, that it's a whole different list. <laughs> this... <laughs> Solid comedic effect, isn't it? As I mentioned before, this is the only political party I've ever been part of. I grew up as a libertarian. I was active in state parties. I was sometimes on the winning side of votes at national conventions and sometimes on the losing side of votes. I had some of the same frustrations you had where sometimes the people who were on the national committee were not representative of what I thought they should be representing me. I have the honor to be the face for all of you. And the pressure of trying to be the face for a group of people that are not always in agreement on everything. This is pretty much the greatest thing that I've ever been able to accomplish in my life. Not barring my wife and my kids, because those are other people, but that I've been able to accomplish. This was more important for me than winning a first degree murder case. It's more important than a law degree. It's more important than running a business. This is the future of this country politically. And to be able to serve you as chair and go around and visit people and hear about what people are doing in their communities, what they're starting, 
what they're running for, how well they did, how, um, you know, they've already got $30,000 lined up for their campaign before nomination. Like, to see that amount of growth and be uh, able to be some small part of it is the best part. There are some bad parts, too. <laughs> yes? When I first started being a libertarian, the topic that I focused on the most, um, it's weird, it was actually before I even identified as a libertarian, I went to a school and we wanted to have a garden, we wanted to plant a garden on the playground, in the side of the playground, which the school didn't want us to do because that's not what it's for. But I thought it would be a cool idea uh, and so I got some of my friends, probably second or third grade, and we came up with a petition, and we went around and we got signatures from all the kids on lined paper and went into the principal's office and says, we want to have this garden, and I have this petition with all these signatures of these kids that want this. Um, and I got a very polite and respectful response to that. We did not get the garden, but I got some um, beans, some dried beans from my mom. And uh, we did some guerrilla gardening around the playground, me and my friends. And we would go out by the side of the fence and we'd plant beans and be like, nobody saw that. Nowadays, there's other guerrilla gardeners that grow all sorts of stuff. <laughs> Sir. The only change that I would make is potentially make it somewhat smaller because a smaller board is able to move quicker uh, without as much time. I don't know if that's a good idea or not, and I don't tend to take opinions on bylaws changes, but if you read Drucker's Managing the Nonprofit Corporation, which is a book that I buy for every new LNC member so that they can have some understanding of what they're getting into and why this is not like ever, everything else. Um, nonprofit boards like ours that are factional serve a different purpose from a corporate board. A corporate board is where the CEO gets a bunch of smart people who share their vision for where they want the company to go, who will give advice and provide connections and you know act as a sounding board. But those people are picked because they're moving in that direction. If you don't share the CEO's vision, you don't get appointed to the board. Our board serves to provide a voice. It's more similar in that way to a legislature, where the idea is that everyone is represented, even if the minority view doesn't always win, you at least feel heard. I think that the lack of effectiveness that you get from having a larger and diverse board is worth it for having a big tent like ours not collapse and not devolve into drawing lines and saying, you know, if you, if you believe this, then I don't want you in my party. Or if you believe that, then I don't want you in my party. I want to kick you out. I needs to be this, not that. Why not both is a pretty good answer to most arguments inside the Libertarian Party. You know, should we run fewer really high quality candidates or more candidates to fill the ballot? Yes. Yes, we should. Absolutely. Do whatever makes you happy, as long as you're not hurting anybody and you're not taking their stuff. So I don't know, I don't know if people want the board to change, but I, I want to make sure that everybody knows what it's for. Um, because then it's kind of like, you know, you don't try and hammer in a nail with the back of a screwdriver. It's not, it's not the right tool. So don't expect the national committee to be, you know, what plays in Peoria, to coin a phrase I think somebody's used. Um, <laughs> sell stuff in Peoria to Peorians that Peorians want and have them ignore people that live in Maryland. Sir.
future where we're going to take a big jump and then we'll be a major player on the national political stage? I see acceleration in the growth rate in addition to steady growth. I think that the curve is not straight. It's actually arcing up um, because success breeds success and effort breeds effort. So people ask all the time, news, newspapers like to ask this, who's going to be the 2020 nominee? And you guys probably have people ask you, who's going to be the 2020 nominee? doesn't matter. It's not, not a worthwhile discussion to have right now. The worthwhile discussion to have right now is how do we get people on every ballot as libertarians? How do we show that we have the organization to run three times as many candidates as we've ever run before? Because when you do that, that attracts a whole new group of candidates to want to be the 2020 nominee. So it's not, you know, go call up, pick your celebrity libertarian and convince them to run. It's build up the organization, build up a party, build up a vehicle that really interesting candidates are like, that's a pretty cool vehicle to get into. I'm, I'm going to get into there. It looks like it'll be fun to drive. It's, it's backwards. You know, it's, it's kind of like when you break up in a relationship, you do better if you don't go chasing your next relationship. Instead, you work on yourself and make yourself a more attractive person. Then your next relationship tends to be a little better. Other questions? Lex? Is it true that the uh, 2020 election is in Hamilton County, Florida? I believe it's going to play in Austin. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to help keep it weird. John? Are you want opinions from me? Um, I think the change that's being proposed to the immigration plank is a good one um, because I think that that causes more. C I was there when that last line of the immigration plank was put in and it was intended to be clarifying and it has ended up being confusing. And so it's not doing the work that we thought that it would do and you know, one of the things that you have to do in life is if stuff stops working, stop doing it. Do something different. You know, doctor, it hurts when I do this. Don't do that. Um, I think it would be nice if the platform specifically said something about student loan dischargeability and bankruptcy. I know that that seems like an esoteric issue, but that's an up-and-coming issue for um, my generation, people slightly younger, that are coming out with federally subsidized student loan debt that is vastly disproportional to the value of their education and thanks to federal laws bought by federal lobbyists, that debt doesn't go away in bankruptcy the way other debts do. So you literally have the feds helping the banks stop people from building a career if they made a bad choice and stop them from getting that restart. Whether or not you believe in bankruptcy laws generally, that's a different question, but it's kind of like we talk about in municipal stuff in Phoenix. I'd love to have taxes go down for every property owner. But what I'm sure about is that taxes shouldn't be cut for big out-of-town developers based on who they know. That if it's going to exist, it should be even across the board. And I think that that's what's happened with student loans, is they become something special and different where you saddle people with debt that they can't get past. Um, I think that would also help tuition drop significantly because if those loans were no longer non-dischargeable, underwriters would be more cautious about what they finance, which would then make colleges have to be more affordable because they wouldn't have free money. Other questions? Sir, and then you. So as far as proof of work networks and blockchain stuff, basically distributed ledgers, um, we have had in the platform for a long time, still do, uh, support for alternative forms of currency or forms of value transaction, metals, cryptos, all that stuff. As a general matter, 
Uh, we don't have a specific plan related to uh, blockchain stuff right now because everything changes. Like day to day, week to week, everything changes in that space. So it's great that stuff's happening, but there's good advice I got about how to be a more effective person. This is just good advice. Do less and obsess. So you can get farther in life by stripping out the stuff that isn't high value tasks and then putting that extra energy back into the things that you're actually good at. As a political party, we're good at running candidates. We're good at getting ballot access. We're good at raising money. We're good at messaging political stuff. I don't know if we're good at crypto, but I'd rather do the stuff we're good at and then open up the field for other people that are good at it to do that stuff. But if the platform committee does something on, on that, then they will. Sir? We have now a full-time press secretary at the national office. Uh, that was a position that's been vacant for quite a few years. Um, he's putting out press releases one and two and three times a week to talk about the issues of the day while they're still current, get them out while they're hot. Um, we just came out with a good release on um, SESTA and FOSTA, which just passed the House but haven't gone through the Senate. Really bad for free speech, really bad for, um, you know, making sex workers' lives more dangerous. We were the only political party to come out on it. Um, they're booking me for interviews all the time. Uh, the people in the back actually listened to, I had an hour-long interview on NPR's 1A program. So we're, it's getting out more. Um, it's just, it's a very busy media market right now. There's more channels and there's more ways to get your message out, but you're competing for everybody else. So we just keep doing it. And sometimes people pick it up. Yes, sir. Uh, I love them all the same. <laughs> <laughs> Bennett, you're going to tell them my time's up? You don't have to be polite. It's me. Thank you guys so much.